So here's an idea. Let's test and compare the fastest Threadrippers against the newest big iron from IBM, like their enormous Z15 mainframe installations. And how fast is an Apple Watch compared to the Apollo Guidance Computer? Or how fast was the Pentium 3 compared to a current Raspberry Pi 3? Some of these are truly going to surprise you when you see the results. Could a Space Age mainframe run Quake or Doom or just Pong? We'll find out. What were the first CPUs to cross the 10 MIPS, 100 MIPS and 1000 MIPS barriers? And how fast are our typical desktop processors today when compared to, let's say, the mainframes of the 1990s? Not for gaming, of course, but if you could have your own used IBM System 390 out in the workshop, should you take that over a basic PC that you could grab at Best Buy? And how do they all compare to that canonical unit of measurement, the computer that landed men on the moon? Look at each of these in more detail, all right here today in Dave's Garage. They say Americans will use any measurement system other than the metric system, such as Olympic swimming pools and washing machines for volumes of water instead of cubic meters. For mileage, maybe your car gets 40 chains to the furlong and that's the way you likes it. And so, it should come as no surprise then that the gold standard for measuring computing performance in the 21st century is still the computer that landed men on the moon some 50 years ago, the Apollo Guidance Computer, or as its close friends refer to it, the AGC. The AGC was an impressive box, particularly for its day. You should really think of it as the first time that the computer industry and the top universities got together and built an impressively compact computer out of the new integrated circuits. Sure, there was still core memory and some of the technologies would look antiquated today, but the vacuum tubes and relays of prior days were now long gone, rendered instead in silicon. And the primary goal was robustness and reliability, not hair-raising performance. After all, if three lives depend on the computer calculating a sine or cosine in order to plot a trajectory, doing it a million times a second isn't all that important. From a practical standpoint, though, doing it ten times a second with ultimate reliability probably is. And though miniaturization is cool, I've always had a soft spot for the really big iron. I mean the ferrofluid, liquid-cooled, data center-grade hardware that was designed to survive any nuclear wars that it did not personally start. I don't know where my fascination started. Perhaps it was walking through the University of Regina back when I was still a little kid where they had a big glass computer lab in which the PDPs and the VAXs sat supreme. They were up on elevated platforms like a pharmacist might be, covered in impressive test blinking lights and they were given powerful names from mythology like Hercules and Venerva. And these are still the names that I give to my own servers all these decades later so I guess something about that visual clearly made an impression on me. My first real exposure to a corporate data center came when I was in the ninth grade. We were each asked what it was we wanted to do with our lives. My aptitude testing had indicated that I was best suited to be a mortician or a chicken farmer. Check out my book on Asperger's and autism in the video description for the whole story, but I kept insisting that I liked computers, so they set about finding a programmer that I could shadow. Once they found a willing subject, they arranged so that I could follow them around for a day on the job and just to get a sense of what the career was really like. I was assigned to accompany a computer programmer at an IBM data center installation known as the Cooperators which primarily handled insurance and billing records for the local government. My dreams were shattered almost instantly. By about 10 a.m., I was ready to drill a hole in my head just to let the boredom out. I mean, this poor fellow's existence was absolutely Sisyphusian, if that's even a word. Just in case it comes up on Jeopardy for you, uh, Sisyphus is a character from Greek mythology that was doomed to push a giant rock up a hill every day only to have it roll back down each and every time. And this programmer's life seemed depressingly similar. He would walk down to the computer lab and get a big ream of the bifold line printer paper, the kind with the old green and white stripes. He'd carry it on up to his desk and he'd stare at it with a pencil in hand until he saw whatever it was that he was looking for, presumably a bug or a suspicious piece of output. To me, it looked like he was playing a crossword puzzle made of gibberish and playing a game that he could seemingly never win. But every so often he'd circle something, make a few notes, and take the ream of corrected paper back to the computer lab where he'd get a fresh problem report and basically, though his expression never changed and he betrayed no sense of satisfaction on each round trip, the rock would roll down the hill over and over all day long. It was a rude awakening and it didn't seem very fun at all. I guess when I said programmer, I meant a fun and cool programmer working on video games in a casual office setting where they play a lot of foosball and have cute blonde artists that sit on your desk with arms akimbo like it's an episode of Mad Men. But this fellow's life seemed more like what programmers in hell might be condemned to, as far as I could see. But then for some reason, we had to visit the actual computer floor, where the big machines lived. I imagine back in the 1980s it would have been a massive IBM System 370 installation. 
The machines were big, loud, and they had some serious presence. They were so powerful and loud that you had to wear hearing protection. In fact, my wife's father, whom I wouldn't meet for another decade yet, would ultimately lose a great deal of his own hearing to working amongst these IBM Leviathans at a competing data center across town. When they really got loaded up, the machines hummed with a deep frequency that you could more feel than hear, and sometimes it seemed as though they might burst into flames at any moment. Of course, should such a calamity actually come to pass, they were so valuable that you couldn't fight the fire by wantonly spraying water everywhere from some hose. And so data centers were generally set up with what was known as halon dumps. All around the facility were special blue fire alarms with blue buttons that would promptly fill the building with halon gas from massive tanks in the basement. Halon is a noble gas that smothers all combustion. It won't poison you, but there's no oxygen left to be had, so there are scuba tanks and breathing apparatus scattered around the facility for any workers that can't immediately escape. I guess halon is murder on the ozone layer, so they don't use it as much anymore these days, but it's still a cool setup. Not something you typically need with a Threadripper. I also distinctly remember being very impressed that the data center had bulletproof windows. Why someone would shoot at a mainframe and why they felt the need for countermeasures, I honestly have no idea, but it seemed like it made them cool and important, at least to me, because after all, nobody was shooting at my dad's hardware store 10 blocks down. Somehow, seeing the big systems is all it took to keep me from switching my desired career path to truck driving school. From then on, I've carried a fascination with mainframe power, but all the while been dogged by the feeling that they're not really any faster than a contemporary PC. It seems like they're playing with the same rules of physics, so ultimately, single-threaded proof can't be any better than it is on an M1 or an i9. At some level, even a Z14 is just a 14 nanometer chip, hardly cutting edge in that sense. That wasn't always the case, and in decades past, the technology gap between the mainframe and the desktop was much, much larger. So in 1969, the question was also valid. How fast was the Apollo guidance computer, built primarily from integrated circuits, compared to the mainframes of that era? We use a 1969 mainframe as a reference point then. Precisely one month after Neil Armstrong stepped onto the lunar surface, IBM released the System 360 Model 195. So it seems eminently fair to compare them to each other. Not Neil and the computer, the two computers. In the nearest I can figure, the big IBM was capable of about three MIPS. At the time, it cost about $200,000 a month to rent one. Now that's about $1.5 million in 2022 dollars. We had started with relays that actually had mechanical arms and magnets inside and shed the moving parts when we moved to vacuum tubes and we picked up several orders of magnitude of speed and reliability when we moved to the transistor. Those transistors were ultimately densely packed into hermetically sealed packages known as integrated circuits and that's where we find ourselves today. I should take a moment to note that I'm talking about instruction speed, not floating point operations. Almost every source you can find for computing performance tends to focus on floating point math and how many floating point operations can be completed per second. You'll hear terms like flops, megaflops, gigaflops, and so on. We're fast approaching the teraflop. Truly astounding figures that unfortunately have very little to do with bread and butter computing. That's because parallelized floating point operations are great for climate modeling and certain types of crypto mining, but what I care about today is how fast it could run my prime sieve. How fast can it do real work? How fast can it do integer math, make decisions, take jumps, load and store data? It probably does little if I tell you how many M-flops an old mainframe can do. But if I tell you that a 1969 System 360 Model 195 had just enough computing performance to run Doom but not Quake, and that it was roughly equivalent to a 486, now you know something you can store in your head. Again, I'm only talking about the CPU processing, not the GPU or the FPU. Every good story starts somewhere, and ours begins with the Univac 1 of 1951. It had a reasonable clock speed of two and a quarter megahertz, but in the early days, instructions were not pipelined, meaning they didn't overlap at all. You started one instruction and it worked on it until it was finished. Then it took a break and then it started on the next one. And each instruction could take so many cycles such that the CPU only ran at 2000 instructions per second. We were working in our preferred unit of MIPS or millions of instructions per second. And so the Univac one comes in at 0.002 MIPS. When the IBM 7030, codenamed Stretch, came along in 1961, it would hold the title as the fastest supercomputer for several years. Even though it was much slower than its aggressive targets, and IBM actually had to refund millions of dollars on the purchase price, it still crested the millions of instructions per second barrier at 1.2 MIPS, and it would be 10 to 15 years before that level of performance trickled down to the more plebeian machines like the VAX 11780, which turned in exactly 1.0 MIPS in 1977. In contrast, the microprocessors of the 1970s, like the 8086, 6809, and 6502, were turning in numbers on the order of half a MIPS. So now you know that a good mini computer was at least twice as fast as the best desktops of the day, and mainframes were about 10 times faster than that. 
Back in the 60s with the big iron, the venerable IBM stretch machine wasn't bested until the CDC 6600 came along in 1965, boasting a speed of 10 MIPS. That's almost identical performance to what you could come to expect from a Motorola 68020 in 1988, almost 23 years later. Within five years of that, the i486-66 would turn out 25 MIPS. Which brings us to 1991 and the i860, their RISC chip. Want some trivia that will impress your friends and frighten your enemies? Well, what a lot of people don't know is that the original Windows NT project was directed at the i860, but since that chip was still in development, it was referred to by its codename, the N10. And NT is actually an abbreviation of N10. It does not and never did mean new technology. That was marketing after the fact. So you could almost think of all modern Windows as an evolution of the branch that began with the i860. And despite its flaws, the i860 was rocking 50 MIPS in a wonderfully symmetrical fashion, 50 MIPS at 50 MHz, meaning one instruction per clock cycle per core, another important milestone. I started on Windows in 1993 and I was working on a box with dual MIPS R4400 CPUs. Though I think mine might have been underclocked to 100 MHz, the 150 MHz variants were capable of 85 MIPS. The first mass-produced chips to cross the 100 MIPS barrier appear to be the Motorola 68060, as seen in the Amiga 4000T, running at 110 MIPS. Given that the A500 ran at 2 MIPS, that would be one fast Amiga. Does anyone out there actually have a 68060 Amiga? Let me know in the comments. Hot on its heels was the Intel Pentium, setting a new standard at 188 MIPS. Back when I was in MS-DOS, I had what I think was the world's worst Pentium ever. I was just an intern, which means they don't order you a big fancy new PC on your first day. They basically give you whatever they have on hand that nobody else wanted, and in my case, that meant the prototype Pentium machine they had from Gateway Computers. That sounded amazing to me at first, as everyone else still mostly had 386s, until I found that the machine was clocked at 8 MHz instead of a more typical Pentium speed like 66 MHz. The machine was built as an engineering sample that was intended to demonstrate compatibility with the instruction set, the memory management unit, and so on, and Intel didn't want anybody benchmarking the Pentium just yet. Had I been older and bolder, I might have swapped in a faster crystal just for fun, but I was too new in those days to take the risk of dorking with my work machine. If you had a Pentium running at 100 MHz in 1994, though, it would turn in a performance of 188 MIPS, the same as my MIPS, which sounds really silly, but MIPS the brand versus MIPS the unit. Just two years later, the PowerPC would be updated, and while the PowerPC 601 had lagged the Pentium slightly at 157 MIPS, the PowerPC 603 of 1995 reached parity with the Pentium at 188 MIPS as well. By 1997, however, they were clocked at 300 MHz and delivered an impressive 423 MIPS. The Intel Pentium Pro would break our next barrier, turning in 541 MIPS in its top trim of 200 MHz back in 1996. The ARM Cortex makes its first appearance on the chart here as an A5 running at 1256 MIPS, but not until the year 2011. It would appear the desktop was about 12 years ahead of mobile in terms of raw performance, but of course, this overlooks power consumption and other factors that we don't care about for this conversation. Here's where it's worth taking some appreciation of power consumption, though, as the Apple Watch S1 processor is comparable to the A5. Let's round down and we'll just call it 1,000 MIPS. So maybe that's another data point to store. The Apple Watch is 25,000 times the raw power of the Apollo Guidance computer. Meanwhile, back on our desktop curve, the Intel Pentium 3 at 600 MHz turned in 2,054 MIPS in 1999. It might surprise you to learn that our next milestone, cresting 5,000 MIPS, was achieved much later on by the Raspberry Pi 3 in 2014. I wouldn't have intuitively thought that a Pi 3 could be more than twice as fast as a Pentium 3, but there you have it. I'm also just sort of blown away by the notion that a little Pi does 5,000 MIPS. In only four more years, the desktop clock speed had accelerated to 3.2 GHz for the Pentium 4 Extreme Edition, which was able to turn in a performance of 10,000 MIPS. An AMD Athlon would bring that up to 20,000 MIPS, and the Intel Core 2 Extreme would reach 50,000 MIPS by 2006. Next comes a chip that I ran for almost seven years, right up until I bought my Threadripper, an Intel i7-4770K. At 133,000 MIPS, it was more than enough power than me for the better part of a decade. Plus, it didn't really feel like CPUs were getting much faster, so I didn't feel the pressure to upgrade. After all, the metric that I think makes the most difference, which is instructions per clock cycle per core, would remain about the same at 8 for CPUs over the next decade. What would change, however, is the number of cores and the clock speed. While the clock speed would accelerate only modestly to about 5.2 GHz today, the number of cores would increase massively from 4 to 64 and then even 128. While you couldn't necessarily solve any one part of a problem any faster, 
To the extent that your problem could be solved in a parallel fashion, the new breed of chips brought massive power to the consumer, which is what prompted me to upgrade. But enough hand-waving, let's put some numbers to it. The AMD 3990 scores a massive 2,356,230 MIPS. That makes this desktop PC more than 2 million times as powerful as a 1980s Amiga or Macintosh, for example, and some 5 million times more powerful than your old Commodore 64, and that's completely ignoring floating point performance, memory and storage speeds, and other hugely important factors that have come as far or further. Going back to our earlier discussion, you might recall that we said that one MIPS was the equivalent of 25 Apollo guidance computers. That means that the AMD 3990 is 60 million times more powerful when considering instructions per second than the Apollo guidance computer that landed men on the moon. By the way, it might have been men that landed on the moon, but it was a woman's code that helped get them there. Margaret Hamilton. In fact, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom for having done so. By the way, there's an amazing book on the AGC that follows the story of its development, and it's got technical details down to the level of the instruction set and how it evolved as well, so I found it a fascinating read. I'll throw the Amazon link in the video description and highly recommend it. Now the big question that provoked this, how does the current IBM mainframe stack up against a desktop PC? Now I can't believe I have to say this, but a mainframe offers things that a PC setup traditionally does not, like hot failover from one CPU core to a backup core and things like that. Just as an Apple M1 contains custom silicon to do video encoding, since it's a core task on the Mac, the IBM Z14 CPU includes silicon aimed at encryption and compression, common tasks on a business or a web platform. The CPU can actually do things like the standard deflate compression algorithm for web serving right on the CPU die using acceleration units. And so in many ways, it's obviously not fair to compare one to the other directly. But if you could get your hands on an IBM Z14 and do something that parallelizes fairly well, like compiling the Unix kernel, it's either going to finish faster or slower than it would on the desktop. And as far as I can tell, here are the hard specs. An IBM Z14 can have up to 40 terabytes of main memory which is accessible to 190 cores running at 5.2 gigahertz. If we make the completely wanton assumption that all else is equal and that the instructions per clock cycle per core is somewhere close, we can see that the clock speed is about a wash because the fastest Xeons are also at about 5.2 gigahertz. The big difference of course is in the sheer number of cores. With 190 cores cranking at the full 5.2 gigahertz rate, it should be almost exactly three times as fast as a 64 core Threadripper. But let's not forget that the Threadripper has two threads per core. But even if we grant it 128 cores, it would still come up about 50% short of the big iron. I get a ton of marketing opportunities in my email each and every morning, all of which I turn down. But the one I'd take would be if IBM would loan me a spare Z14 running Linux on IBM Z so I could demonstrate it to the world running their hypervisor platform. They just need to drop a banded unit off with a liftgate truck. I'd move the home of the famous Prime's benchmark project over to it for sure and then get it running the Linux kernel compilation benchmarks as those parallelize so nicely. I've got 150 amps of power and a lot of AC. I hope I was able to shed some light on the relative performance of these systems in a way that was ideally entertaining and historically informative. Check the description for any errata and mistakes as always, and if you enjoy this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future content like it. And in case you've never seen the software drag racing series where I compare the head-to-head -head performance of different computing languages, I'll put a link to it up in the corner here. I'm primarily in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.